It's been a while. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <sighs> What did we talk about last time? I think Dobbs. No, I think render engines. Was it Dobbs? Was uh, it render engines? Was it aliens? I don't know. I don't know. It is, uh, it, yeah, it has been a while. So we've been discussing the topic for today's nerd rant. And you came up with a topic that I, in contrast to most other topics that you proposed, quite enjoyed. Although it is not related to Houdini, or only Remotely. sort of. Remotely. Uh, I wanted to talk about Blender. And I'm fine with that. Because Blender generated quite a hype recently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And my, that is due to their 2.80 release. Yeah, my Twitter timeline was full of it. Either people raving about the release, or people pointing to another company that's now part of the Blender uh, development firm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I wouldn't uh, talk about it if it wouldn't be free. It is completely <laughs> is, 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 free. Is that, is that the only reason you're talking about it? I, I think so. Because, Seriously. Um, as it is free, it really offers itself as a companion to Houdini. But it, not just because it's free, right? No, no, of course not, because it's a good program in my opinion, but um, if you have to spend a lot of bucks on a second 3D program, you think twice, because why, why, Houdini why? is perfectly capable of doing everything that you want to do. Yeah, why would you spend bucks, or why would you spend time with any other program than, than Houdini? <laughs> Uh, because of the shortcomings of Houdini. Are there shortcomings of Houdini? Never heard of them. I think so. One of them is, at least for my personal taste, that we don't have a destructive, mo yeah. destructive modeler. Yeah, that's a Houdini. huge gap. And um, although I really enjoy procedural modeling, and it is very, um, very uh, useful for a lot of cases, if you want to animate stuff or build digital assets, it's just a godsend. But if you want to model quickly a hard surface asset for your game or for your movie, yeah. and or if you just want to design stuff quickly, like, uh, I don't know, if, if we're doing style frames for a new Nike commercial or something, No, I really like it better to just have a destructive model where I can go in and fiddle with the points and polygons. Yeah, I totally get that. And uh, don't have to create a large hierarchy of nodes yeah. and then remember which action I did and go in there and reselect the points for the group. No, no I, I really enjoy having a destructive model. And up until now, I used Symbol 3D for that. And uh, now we have a second competitor on the market that is priced quite con uh, competitive. <laughs> well, it's free. <laughs> it's free, exactly. <laughs> so that is um, why I had a second look at Blender, because I, I looked at Blender uh, in the past, mm -hmm. but it was always very cumbersome to use. When did you look at it? I looked at it with version 2.4 for the first time, I think. What was that? that? Was, When year? What, what year oh, was that? I don't know, 2008 or something, uh, 10 years ago. Because it was free, and I was I am always interested in, in, in software. I just enjoy looking at software. Yeah, I can see that. To see what they do, and back then it was, I was astonished about what it can do. Yeah. But at the same time, I just said no. That was my experience. I tried it two times. I tried it once when it was pretty new, and it was all the first wave of hype, and it was like published in all the computer science magazines. And it was just a nightmare to use. It was just, you, you couldn't, you could get nothing done just by intuition. Exactly. So I just threw it away, closed it, and at the end of my university degree, I was like, yeah, okay, let's try Blender again. It sounds interesting, and people quite, quite like it. Installed it, and again, it was this nightmare of a, of a user experience. It was just such a, yeah, such a non-standard program. No, absolutely, absolutely. For me, it was a little different. I was, uh, I was um, repelled by it, mainly due to its ugly look. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, to be honest, it was really ugly. With but that, I don't understand that. Okay, but versions okay. before 2.5, and then they came out with 2.5. I don't remember exactly when, uh, and then suddenly it was quite beautiful, mm. and I was like, "Oh, I give it a try again." But then, yeah, and I, I watched some tutorials and I tried to use it, but it was, yeah, the workflow was very specific. Yeah. If you use it on a daily basis, the workflow was great because a lot like ZBrush, you learn all the shortcuts and the strange action chains that you need to memorize to use it, and then you can get up to a very high speed with it. But for somebody like me who wants to use it occasionally and who does not want to memorize millions of shortcuts, it was a nightmare. And then strange decisions like selecting with the right mouse yeah, button yeah, and that stuff was, like that. Yeah, that was just terrible. And uh, strange navigation and just always different. So since when did you stick with Houdini then? With Houdini? Yeah. Then. With Blender, of course. With 2.80. 2.8? 2.8. 2.8. 
So that is this hyped release, yeah. and I think they did a lot of things right this time because they they just changed the paradigm of the program. I have the impression because now you have icons and you have descriptive menus yeah. and um, you select with left click and everything. It's a lot more standard than it used to be. Yeah, and you pushed me to actually uh, give it another try yeah. with two point eight, and I did, and I was quite surprised because in contrast to uh, your recommendation, I did not use the standard keyboard palette and just just assigned a few uh, custom things that weren't right. I just went with, when you started, you can select with a Blender palette or with industry standard shortcuts. And I went with the industry standard shortcuts. And I was amazed how easy and straightforward it is to get into it as your standard Absolutely, and, and I think um, although they put a lot of nice features into the software, that is the most important part of the hype. Mm -hmm. That you are that it's now just accessible. Yeah, it's finally you usable. You open it and you have the feeling regarding its entire look, the UI. Um, it's a polished and standard piece of 3D software instead of something weird from a different dimension. Yeah. And that is why I, I really think that, that Blender could be used as a very nice companion to Houdini. For destructive modeling. A, for destructive modeling. That is why I looked into it. But there yeah. are more reasons. I mean, Blender can do pretty much everything. You can do simulation and stuff. But if you have Houdini, you don't want to. What kind of simulations simulation. can you do inside of Blender? Pretty much everything. It has a, a wrapping of the bullet engine. Uh -huh. It can do uh, fluids. Um, they are actually, at the moment, imp uh, or wrapping uh, Manta Flow, which is a scientific fluid simulation network or library. Okay. Um, that is okay, but... Of course, not on par with Houdini. You mm -hmm. don't want to do a simulation there. And then simulation had the very standard approach of just putting in values into a given interface, so no nodes and... Okay, so no in-depth configuration of no. your simulation networks. That's not interesting. But um, the, uh, the modeling, and then there is Eevee. And Eevee is a real-time PBR viewport. And that is just gorgeous, really. It is very high quality, and it looks it just looks like your game engine, but with the controls or the setup of a 3D program. Yeah, we've been we've been talking about this because I was like, I want to look at something new. I'm not sure if I should look at Unity or Unreal. And you were like, no, 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 look at Blender. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and yeah, but you were right. I mean, I was looking at game engines because I wanted to render in real time or interactively, let's put it like that. So you are not looking into game engines because you are a game developer. No. Or you want to develop a game, right? No, no, no. And I don't want my setups to be interactive. I just want my frame rates to go up. Exactly. And I think for that, Blender is really an option. Yeah. Because I, I'm by no means an expert regarding game engines. But I find in Blender all the techniques that are state of the art, yeah. like reflection probes and even GI, baked GI is in there and everything, shadows, um, subsurface scattering, you name it, and, volumetric lighting, and, and you, it is fast and it is nice and it looks gorgeous. Yeah, and when you come from a 3D content creation standpoint towards game engines, they are really alienish territory with terrible hacks. Terrible hacks they of course have to do because your customers in the end will care if this thing runs at 30 frames per second or 60 frames no, per absolutely, second. No, absolutely, but it is not that what scares me away from game engines, but it's a cumbersome and strange usage of them. It's just, uh, A, again, Unreal Engine, for example, it's just plain ugly. <laughs> well, it's colorful, let's yeah, put it that way. it looks very 90s style, like iPhone But it's, 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 not, it's not that Unity is beautiful. No, that is what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying. Um, but, but that's not the point. The point is that, it, to me, the usage feels alien. Of course, you can learn that, and it is all um, very intelligent, probably, if you want to develop a game. But I don't want to develop a game. I just want to shape my assets, PBR, real time, to check if they can be used in yeah. a game and how they would look in, the, in a game. That is what interests me. So as a test environment, I was really happy to encounter Eevee. And not only that, you can even use the rendering in production for uh, quick stuff. If you just do have, have to create a hot layer for some sort of sci-fi animation, why not render yeah. it in real time yeah. with volumetrics and glow and everything? Yeah. It's nice, and it's fun to play around with it. So I, I just started to play around with it. Cool. That is something that's a, a plus for Blender. But, but it does not stop there, because uh, Blender has a very nice ecosystem of add-ons. Okay. Um, uh, they are written in Python, and that means they're usually not very performant. Yeah, it doesn't sound fast. Is that a word in English? Performant? Performant, I, th I think so. Fast well, is what well, I, I wanted to say. Um, but there are... 
uncommon uh, ideas there in this add-on realm, and that is fun. Okay. So there is one that uh, that is called um, Mesh Machine, for example, that has a nice bunch of hard surface modeling tools that are really just gorgeous. Um, you are very, very quick using that. But there are others, like, for example, the Grove. If you ask me, the Grove for Blender is the best tree creation software out there. Okay. Because it is, it's, a, it's just a Python add-on for Blender, but... It does not create procedural trees like a lot of other approaches, like XFROG, for example. Is XFROG an L system or something like that? No, XFROG is, is really a procedural component system, much like Houdini. Okay. If you go uh, to SOPS and start to build a tree by starting with a trunk asset and then putting, I don't know, um, scattering some points on the trunk, putting branches to them and going on like that, then you create a procedural tree. Mm -hmm. A hierarchy, yeah. basically. That is how X fork works, and I think Speed Tree does too. Okay, but the growth uh, um, does it differently. It grows trees, so it's based on biological uh, tree growth research. How do trees grow? Okay. So it, it grows the tree and then it evaluates the lighting. And if a branch, for example, does not receive enough light and nutrition, it dies and mm -hmm. falls off and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And that gives really, really amazing and natural results. And at the same time, you can just click a button and it will uh, just wiggle in the wind and it will export to Alembic. And you open it up in Houdini, and there you have your animated tree. Wow. And the whole thing, it's, it's, it's really cheap. Wow. I don't remember from the back of my head how much it costs, but it's, it's not much. Okay. And um, uh, then they have another uh, nice idea, and that is called twigs. So instead of putting the individual leaves on the tree, yeah. like many other softwares yeah. do, do, they have um, little uh, photo-scanned twigs, uh -huh. little bunches of, I think... 12 to 15 leaves, yeah. and they put them on the generated tree. And that gives another level of realism. And the right. nice thing is, as everything is an Alembic export with attributes, so all the simulation attributes are written to point attributes on the Alembic. That is cool. You can just recreate um, these as instances inside of Houdini, and it will be fast, and it will be fun, and it's nice. Oh. So it's just an example that uh, Blender using uh, usage opens up a new world of, of, of different add-ons too. So I think it's really, it's, it's two days of video tutorials on Blender well spent to have a look at it. <laughs> uh, what, do you, what do you think of the impact that Blender is going to have in the long or maybe midterm to the whole industry, to the other competition? Hmm. I don't know. I think it will uh, create quite a stir because uh, it is free and it is good. And the Blender Development Fund... I think at the moment supports 18 full-time developers. Wow. So they are um, releasing with a, with a, a fast pace, really, four months, five months next version. I think more and more people will start to use Blender. And of course, they are not adopted into a, a AAA pipelines yet because that is a lot of work. Yeah. But who knows? And if you look at the names that are supporting Blender through the development fund... I think it's Unreal, right? It is Unreal, yeah. Um, NVIDIA, AMD... Intel, I think. Intel, and even companies like Adidas. That is, that is an odd one, but yeah. Yeah. And um, the good thing is that everybody can just pick up the software and start creating stuff for their game or whatever. That is just nice. Is it a software you would recommend to a person starting uh, its path into 3D? It's a good question, but I think so, yeah. Because a lot of people will answer um, no. Why? Because it is not an industry standard, and if you want to go AAA, you have to learn the programs that the big studios are using, and they are using Maya for modeling, mm -hmm. or at least for scene assembly and, 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 and asset creation. Yeah. Um, and that's totally true. If you want to go to FMX in Stuttgart and go to one of these um, uh, booths where the big companies are, are recruiting. Um, recruiting, you probably want to have a Maya showreel if you want to show off your modeling. Yeah. Or a ZBrush reel if you want to show off your sculpting. Of course. But I think this specialization comes later in a, in a personal career. And if you want to start out with, with um, 3D Blender, it's your best bet because it is free and it includes all the concepts that are necessary to learn 3D. And it is about the concepts, to be honest. You have to learn the 3D concepts and after that comes all the other stuff. And yeah, I mean, that, that is our approach to how to. we teach. I mean, there are 
other views on that out there, but I very much support that of understanding the concepts first. And I think, yeah, Blender, not only not only because of its price point, but at this time also because of its accessibility, which in my opinion just came with 2.8 or 2.8. No, no, absolutely. But the price point is very chunks. important too. Back in the day when I went to university, 1995, we had four silicon graphics machines, which were ridiculously and expensive. And your pixels were made of wood. Exactly. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a big problem because I, 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 I had two hours a day on the machine. Um, as a student, and I was like, I will never learn this. It's but well, too complicated. But well, you could you could argue that um, even with commercial software, um, software got more accessible with the introduction of subscription models. That is true, and uh, especially with the introduction of stuff like the Apprentice version of Houdini. Yeah. That is just gorgeous. Yeah. But the nice thing is that you can use it commercially, so you start oh, yeah. in Blender and can use it in and I'm pretty sure that it will get more and more adopted in the industry because hey, it's free and it is good. And it also runs on Linux. I mean, you can. That's true. I mean, when we're talking about a Blender slash Houdini pipeline, and maybe we should turn this into another nerd rant about a pure Linux pipeline at some point, mm -hmm. because that's what currently I'm not sure if it's just a pipe dream or a naive wish of mine, but I would love to have a pure Linux pipeline. Not because I find Linux rather. <laughs> Not because I find Linux easy to use, <laughs> but uh, it's faster in some instances, and again, it's free. But that's that's topic for another nerd, right? Absolutely, I guess. No, it has many advantages. But that is a nice thing. That is a nice thing. And at the same time, Blender has a very <laughs> it's a very different program compared to Houdini, mm -hmm. but sort of the approach is similar. Because like Houdini, Blender supports a lot of areas of the content creation pipeline. Like you have cops in Houdini, you have a compositor in Blender. You even have a video sequence editor directly built into Blender. It is shit, if you ask me, sorry, <laughs> but it gets better and better all the time. And um, there will be the point where it's not shit anymore, but great and usable. And um, that happened with the 3D parts and sculpting got a big overhaul now with the latest version of Blender. Cool. It's getting better and better all the time and a lot of very talented programmers are working on it all the time. So I think I think you as, a, as Houdini users give Blender a try as a little companion. And it's, I think you're going to help them. I, I, th I thought about doing some tutorials. Why not? Yeah. Because... Um, Although the Blender community is vast, there is so much information out there that is probably not that important to somebody who is not using Blender as his main program. Yeah. Um, and I'm using it for what I what I outlined before, modeling EB. And I was thinking about doing some tutorials on how to export your animation from Houdini just to render them in, them in, in Eevee or how to quickly model something in, in Blender and bring oh. it over as a, I don't know, FBX or um, WebGL, for example. And uh, not WebGL. How is it called? Alembic? No, the new format by uh, the standard... Uh, USD? No, TG... How is it called? I'm out of the green loop. one that they just the, added to Houdini and Blender. I'm out of the, the JPEG of 3D. I don't know. Ah, we, just, yeah, we got to look that up. We're going to put it in the comments or in the, put it in the description. We'll put it in the description. And you put in the comments if you'd like to see Blender tutorials on Antagma or just maybe stuck with one Blender tutorial. Uh, anything else we need to add? Anything else we need to? Oh, there is there is a lot to add to the Blender discussion. But I think regarding uh, Houdini users. That is at least my two cents. Yeah, just, give it a try. Yeah, I'm just thinking about. Yeah, I think I have nothing to add to that. Trying Blender seems like a good idea. It's mm -hmm. way more accessible now. Um, way less frustration. True. So yeah, definitely do that. And I think Linux and all the other topics that we touched upon might be the topic of another nerd rant. Probably. All right, guys. So, yeah. Thanks that's for listening. Our two cents on Blender, and see you soon.